Hello and welcome to your first set of notes in AP Psychology. I'm starting here looking at the link that's been provided to you for a set of notes that I provide with some information already on it. Please feel free to use that because it's kind of a better guide as you go along, but I totally encourage you to also do what you would like. And if you'd like to take notes on a loose leaf sheet of paper or do some Cornell notes, that's totally fine as well. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here. Um, our first set of notes is kind of laying the, the base for psychology, kind of laying what is going to, we're going to build off of for the, for the rest of the course, and it's explaining why psychology, what is it, what are the approaches to it, and you'll really see those approaches throughout the rest of the course. So we will go ahead and get started. Pre-scientific psychology, which this is one of the learning objectives that you have to understand the philosophical contribution to psychology, and that comes from the people listed here on that screen. They first started with a very philosophical thinking of what is the relationship between the mind and the body. And you'll see on the left there that the Hebrews, Aristotle being a big name that's asked by College Board as well as Augustine are all ones that believed that the mind and body are somehow connected and that they are one entity, whereas the mind and body are distinct. They are two separate things, although they could be related. They are two separate entities Socrates, Plato, and Descartes believed. Um, and then they also, again, this is pre-scientific, this is philosophical, how are ideas formed? And the debate being, are we born with anything in our mind or do we all learn it? Is it, is it does it come from our environment? Um, Socrates and Plato said that some ideas that we have are inborn, that we're born with those ideas. Whereas Aristotle and Locke said, no, no, the mind is a blank slate. We are born with nothing. We learn and consume everything from our environment. So let's talk about as um, psychology becomes a science. Structuralism is a big term in unit one and learning the history of psychology. Wilhelm Wundt is the father of psychology. That's a frequent question on AP exams and our exams in this course. He established the first formal lab in 1879 in Germany. Um, the goal was to study consciousness in, um, as he started with this structuralism thing, so how the elements of the mind were organized and related to one another. And they were, they were looking at the structures of the mind. Again, how they're organized and related. And they used introspection, that's a big vocabulary term, which is simply just looking inward, which nowadays in our culture we're like, well, of course you look inward. But back then, as the science of psychology was developing, just the thought of looking inward about how you feel and what you're thinking was something new. As psychology is developing more and more, they come up with a perspective or an approach of functionalism, another big one. William James, you should definitely make sure to note this, um, was the first American psychologist. He criticized Wundt for his ideas being too narrow and boring. Um, he was influenced by Darwin. Um, he also used introspection, but also questionnaires and mental tests. And with functionalism, he's wanting to um, look at the function of the parts of the brain, not just what they are and how they are related. There is some controversy if uh, Will William James or G. Stanley Hall had the first real research lab, though. Um, James was thought to be the... Um, a demonstration lab for his students not to conduct research so um, and then another note to make is that they admitted the first woman into Harvard's graduate program um, around this time she did not graduate but it's something to note um, so gestalt psychology with Max Wertheimer is another big step as psychology becomes a science um, he founded the revolt against want and his ideas and believed consciousness was best understood by observing the whole experience. Gestalt is a very part, important part of psychology and in our objectives. Um, Gestalt is looking at the whole. Say, their catchphrase being, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And we'll learn more about Gestalt in the sensation and perception unit. Um, so an example to kind of help you understand with Gestalt is that like a movie, for instance, there are large strips of film, right, containing thousands of still photographs. 
So describing each of those photographs would not capture a person's whole experience of the film, right? It's the whole film that we look at, not the different strips. Psychoanalysis is huge, and this is Sigmund Freud. He's kind of like the bobblehead of psychology that most of us think of him when we think of psychology. Um, but he's actually only a, a, a significant but small part. Um, psychology is kind of joining the modern world with psychoanalysis. It's the first theory that gave an overall view of personality. There's a huge emphasis on the unconscious. Notice how unconscious is bolded and in purple here. That is the buzzword of psychoanalysis. Um, and he believed that problems arise from unresolved conflicts in our unconscious mind, right? That all of our behavior and mental processes are directed from our unconscious. And they said that it's our unconscious is out of our awareness. We use something called free association um, and dream analysis to explore the unconscious mind. Free analysis is, you know, like the laying on the chase lounge and I'm going to show you this picture. Just say exactly what comes to mind as soon as you... As soon as, don't even think, just say exactly what comes to mind. No resistance, no hesitations. Um, these ideas were very, and still are, controversial, um, but they definitely have a, a big influence on, on psychology. Behaviorism is another kind of modern um, view in psychology. Um, became very popular in the 1920s and 60s with J.B. Watson and B.F. Skinner. We will learn more about them in Unit 6 but they disagreed with practically everyone in the field thus far and believe that psychology should only study what can be observed and measured objectively, and that is our behavior. Um, Skinner also insisted that solely external factors shape behavior, that we are born with no thoughts, no nothing, and the hidden parts of our mind, like our thoughts and our unconscious and all that stuff, is irrelevant. All you need to look at is our behavior and what we learn from our environment. In contemporary psychology, we've got this um, big debate, and this is psychology's big debate, right, um, of nature versus nurture. And if we're looking at the definition of psychology up at the top here, is it's the scientific study of behavior, being what we do, and mental processes being our inner thoughts and feelings, well then where, do, where does all of that kind of stem from? Is it our nature, and you should write this down, our nature being our biology, it's what we are conceived with, not just born with, it's our genetic makeup, or is our environment and our experiences, our nurture, more important and more influential in our behavior and mental processes? Some things that we can discuss there are then psychological disorders like depression or multiple personalities, right? Does that stem from nature or nurture or even sexual orientation? Is that genetically determined or is that learned through environment? Our intelligence, are we born with a set amount of intelligence um, or even becoming a serial killer? Are serial killers born or are they taught? Very interesting debate. Um, the kind of Re the research supports and the overall idea that we've kind of accepted in the field of psychology is that nurture works on what nature endows. And you might want to write that down. It's, it's a combination of both. Nurture, the environment works on what nature, our biology endows, what it gives, what it deals, right? The cards that you are dealt. Contemporary psychology um, takes the approach of biopsychosocial and that they take all three parts there biological, psychological, and social. Um, the biological influences being the genetic ones, right? They want to they wanna look at all mental and behavioral processes through genetics, the mutations, um, natural selection. And then there's the psychological, which is the learned fears and other learned expectations, our cognitive, which is thinking, cognitive processes, and social culture is the presence of others, right? Like, how does our culture, our society, and our family, and those expectations influence us, our peers, and then compelling models such as the media? How do all of those three of those things come to influence our behavior or mental processes? Um, so psychology's perspectives. This is the meat of our notes. I mean, yes, all the other stuff is important, but the current perspectives is really what I want to sink in right now and you to take moving forward. 
Um, I would suggest maybe even making this chart like on a loose leaf sheet of paper um, to jot down the focus of each of these perspectives, but then also adding another column of buzzwords. Buzzwords are huge. This is what you would see in a test question that would indicate to you, okay, that's what the perspective is. So if it says um, natural selection or mutation um, or genes for survival, that's definitely evolutionary. Okay, so um, with neuroscience, it's focused on understanding how the brain um, and body create thoughts, right? Like how our physical makeup of the brain and body, so things like neurotransmitters and neurons all contribute to our mental processes. And the questions being how are messages transmitted through the body, the answer being through neurons, and how is blood chemistry linked with motives? Neuroscience, and you could say biological, um, that's kind of another term for this perspective, is anything with the brain, the body, and anything physical. Evolutionary, sometimes also called social biological. Um, I haven't seen that as much, but if you see it, you know. Focuses on how the natural selection process has caused behavior with genes to develop and adapt. This is like today's functionalism, okay? Um, but they're looking at how natural selection um, contributes to the spreading of our genes, right? And the continuation of our species. So how does evolution influence behavior tendencies and allowing us to survive? Um, and then behavior genetics, how much our genes and environment influence individual differences. It's not just looking at genetics, it's looking how genetics then influences our environment. So to what extent does our genes and our environment impact personality, intelligence, or mental disorders? Psychodynamic is, and you should make a note of this, today's psychoanalytic. Um, so it's an emphasis on the unconscious mind as the director of all behavior, right? How does the energy from the unconscious motivate our actions? And that would be the buzzword, the unconscious, and the sexual and aggressive drives that are stored in our unconscious. Behavioral is all about what we learn, right? Our behavior is shaped by the learning process how do we learn to fear particular objects or learn our problematic and then therefore change our problematic behavior? So the buzzwords being learned, reinforcements, punishments, things like rewards, okay? Um, so then cognitive, and I want you to write this down. When you think cognitive, think thinking. Cognitive is thinking, thinking is cognitive. Anything with thinking is cognitive. So how we take in, store, and retrieve info and how our perceptions influence our actions. So information we remember, and how does interpretation impact behavior? So thinking, interpretation, um, all of those things being buzzwords for cognitive. Humanistic is emphasis on human growth and the self. You should write self really big in your notes. It's an overemphasis, you could argue, on the self. And the big question for study is how can I make myself a better person and reach my full potential? Buzzwords being the self, self-actualization, full potential, um, all of those kind of towards the, the hippie viewpoint of psychology, which is humanism. And then social culture, which takes social influences and then the kind of norms and ideas of our culture and how that influences our behavior. So anything with um, peer groups or family or cultural norms all being buzzwords there. So let's talk about these subfields, which is a whole nother kind of objective in psychology. Subfields being if I were to become a psychologist and I wanted to do basic research, this would be one of the fields where I want to do my research. And you should write that down. Biological being all about the connection between mind and body, right? The neurotransmitters of the brain. Developmental is all about, okay, what about our lifespan? And when do we develop certain things like language and cognition and all of those? Cognitive is all about how we perceive, think, and even solve problems. Personality is, again, involving those, those persistent traits, like how is our personality developed? Social, exploring the many ways in which others influence the individual, and vice versa. This just kind of giving you a breakdown of where research is. Um, big one being developmental as well as social. Applied research, then, 
right? And then it's not just doing the research, it's going out and using the information, okay? So applying the research. So if I wanted to become a psychologist where I applied the research that's being found, these are the subfields I could go into. Industrial organizational is all about the workplace. So studies and advises on behavior in the workplace. Sports, that's a big area, right? Like how to maximize performance. School, you guys probably have, might have some experience with school psychologists and even counseling. Counseling isn't just a counselor in school though. It's marital challenges, anything with raising children, coping with any kind of difficulties. And then clinical is a big area. The study and assessment and treat people with psychological disorders, but they do not prescribe medication. This is where psychotherapy is used. This is Dr. Phil. And this just kind of showing you those areas, the biggest portion being clinical. So the last thing to look at here in our first set of notes is the um, applied research subfield of clinical psychology, which is like your Dr. Phil's, right? Comparing that to psychiatry so that you know what a clinical psychologist does and does not do. So a clinical psychologist would get a PhD, right? A doctorate of philosophy, but it's in the field of psychology. Those study, they study, assess, and treat troubled people using psychotherapy, right? That's that talk therapy, which looks different depending on the perspective that they use. So they are of the subfield in psychology of clinical. They are a clinician. Um, but they then could use a perspective like psychodynamic or humanistic or cognitive in their subfield of clinical psychology to use psychotherapy and treat people. They cannot prescribe medication. They do not have their medical degree, right, um, which is an MD, that's the doctor. They are not a, a medical doctor. So a psychiatrist, on the other hand, are medical professionals. They have their MD. Um, and they use treatments like drugs and other psychotherapies to treat psychologically diseased patients. Okay, so they can treat with biomedical, meaning drugs, right, medications, but um, a clinical psychologist cannot, and that's a very key difference to know, and I would mark that in your notes.